Let's give God praise, the praise and worship, leave the platform tonight. Amen. Appreciate their ministry as always. If you have your Bibles tonight, church, I'd like you to turn to 3 John chapter, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 2, uh, 3 John uh, verse 2 tonight. Amen. What we're doing uh, in our series on our Wednesday night victory services is we have begun from last week uh, to look at the subject of prosperity. Now, as I mentioned last week, prosperity has a, 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 a bad taste in, in, the, in the mouths of Christians because of the prosperity gospel, uh, because of fraudsters. But we understand that the Bible speaks about prosperity and that what we looked at last week is that it's God's will that God wants us to prosper. That doesn't mean that we, you know, we, we drive around in Rolls Royces and we all have gold teeth. What, what it means, though, is that we increase. What it means, the definition of um, prosperity is a thriving or growing condition, especially as concerns finances. We considered last week, is prosperity good? That actually when you don't prosper, it's hard. It hurts. Prosperity is a good thing. We looked last week at it being God's will. But what we're considering throughout this series is what is the path or where or how do we achieve financial prosperity? See, what I want to talk about today is I want to begin to talk about why people don't prosper. Because if we're going to prosper, we need to first understand we want to prosper, but what are the reasons as to why so many people in life do not prosper so that we can deal with that and therefore we can continue to prosper or begin to build uh, the ability to prosper. One of the biggest issues that the Bible defines or shows us that hinders prosperity is the issue of poverty. And so here's the issue. You can't prosper if you are constantly living in poverty. In, in the UK in 2021-22, they say that statistically speaking across the country, one in five people were living in poverty. Now, I'm sure country to country, that's not the same. It's relative. It's relative poverty. But the point is clear. So if one in five, 20% of people in the UK are not able to increase, are under the circumstances, are never able to get ahead, living in a condition where they should not be. I've considered, well, okay, where are we? Where do we stand? And it turns out that the West Midlands was the highest region on the survey for poverty at 27%. P a post-COVID uh, poverty report stated this. It said millions of people in the UK are struggling to get by, leading insecure and uh, precarious lives held back by in, uh, from improving their living standards. It's time to take action on poverty and put this right. So if we're going to prosper, what I want to do this week and actually next Wednesday night as well, we're going to do this in two sections because it's actually too big of an area. But we're going to talk about issues of poverty, a poverty mindset, what causes us to think with a poverty mindset, how, you know, all of those different habits and things that when you look at finances or blessing or prosperity, one person can look at it and they can begin to prosper. Another person will look at the same thing or receive the same amount of money, but then they will be more impoverished because of it. So there's lots of issues we're going to look at, but what I want to do tonight is begin with the root. And what the Bible says is that the issue of poverty actually begins at a curse. 
that it is a supernatural dimension that we need to tap into. In other words, it's not simply, I need to budget better. I need to do this. I need to be wiser with my spending investment. And all of those things are true. And so don't just take this one sermon and run with it. And I don't need, right? We need all of those things. And it's a series. But, but to start with tonight, I want to deal with the root and break the curse of poverty over our lives. So let me talk about that tonight. Third John chapter 2. The Bible says, Beloved, I pray, sorry, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Let me talk first of all tonight about beyond the money. You see, the opposite of prosperity is poverty. The definition of that is a deficiency and impoverishment or where you don't have enough. And the reality is we've all experienced that. It doesn't matter how well off you are, how much money you have today. Even if you, everybody would have experienced not having very much money at some point in their life or for prolonged periods of life. You might have heard the phrase, I've got too much month at the end of the money. How many people can recognize that? Amen. You see, the problem with poverty though, is that it makes us unable to do things. It is an inability in life and finance. What it means to start with is there is an internal or an inward insufficiency. Poverty affects me. It affects what I can do, right? I'm unable to pay my bills every month. I have to juggle this or juggle that. I can't eat. I can't do that because there's not enough money. And I'm unable to meet my needs. I can't pay this or that. I'm unable to uh, uh, get ahead. And that because poverty causes us to be unable in ourselves. Many people in the world uh, today, even in, the, even in prosperous countries, we live month by month, which actually is not, is not a way that we want to or should kind of live. You know, UK statistics in 2024, they say that uh, the th one third of adults in the UK either have no savings or less than a thousand pounds in their savings. Now, I'm not going to show a raise of hands tonight, amen, but, but, but many would recognize, man, you know what, that's me. Man, I struggle. I try. I put a hundred pounds, but then it goes away. I try three, and then it goes away, and I can never seem to get by. The Bible actually gives examples of people who live in poverty, and the point is they are unable to prosper. First Kings seventeen twelve. So she said, "As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin." And the jar of oil, uh, 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 and, and a jar of oil, and see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. This woman recognized we are impoverished; we don't have enough, and and therefore it's affecting how we live. Second Kings chapter four verse one, another reference of a woman in scripture, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elijah saying, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor is coming to take my sons to be his slaves. You see, poverty affects our families. Poverty affects how we, what we do, the outcomes of our lives. It is not a good thing that we would be impoverished. But the Bible also says that poverty affects us with an outward sufficiency too. In other words, it affects us, our, our ability to bless others and God. I mean, if you know, it's a very horrible position to be in. If you're sitting in conference or you're sitting in an offering or there's a pledge or something's going on and you say, man, I want to be able to give. 
but we don't have anything. I wish I could participate. I wish I could, but we're in debt. I'm paying this off. I'm paying that off. And you, I mean, you can't give, amen. When, 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 when you can't give on a credit card. You can't, it's like, man, I don't have any money. Money has been designed by God to flow through life. It flows to us. It flows through us and becomes a blessing. But poverty stops the flow because when I'm in poverty, everything I have, I have to consume simply to survive. Like I said, there are lots of reasons why we experience poverty. Sometimes it is hardship. And Paul the Apostle said, I've learned to abase and to abound. Uh, We've all been abased at some point. There's not much going on. Tighten the belt. This is a difficult month. We're eating beans this month. Right? Sometimes, though, it is mindset. Sometimes it's a lack of opportunity. I was raised in the wrong area. I was educated in the wrong way. And we're going to look at those things. But we first need to deal with the reality and the foundation that poverty is a spiritual force. It is actually a supernatural issue. The Bible uses words when it talks about money. And the Bible typically uses the words blessing or curse. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's not just he does well, they don't do well. But actually, they are blessed or they are cursed. Financial poverty in the Bible is connected with curse. Malachi 3 verse 9, you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me even this whole nation. The idea of a curse is to bind with a spell or to make powerless for someone to resist something. In other words, it's like being held hostage without you knowing it. And so you have no power for somebody else to do what they want to do. You could describe it, if you like, as the idea of an open door. Right? So if just imagine if our doors at church didn't have a lock and they were open all of the time. We would come on Sunday, on Wednesday. We'd have youth and practice and all sorts of things. But we would only be here certain times because the doors would be open and we would have church like normal. But throughout the whole week, people who we don't know could come and go as they please. Right? So one service we come and the microphone stands gone. Where did that go? I don't know. Who took it? No one here took it. We don't know what's happened. Right? And then next thing, the sound desk goes. God forbid that happens. But uh, well, or, but something happens. The banner and the chair and this and that. And, and all of those things happen. Uh, where did they go? I don't know. The issue is not anybody here. The issue is that there's an open door. Or you could describe it spiritually. There's a curse at work. Which means that p- things can go in as they please. You see the Bible says that there are two effects of a curse of poverty in our life. One of those reasons is a negative situations that rob or eat away at your finances. Maybe God, you, you can recognize this tonight. We've all had bad situations in life. Good seasons, bad seasons. But sometimes there is a pattern. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how much money you earn. You always seem to be broke. Why why can't I get ahead? I'm broke again. Another financial disaster after the last one. You know, for, for one, it's reoccurring sickness that constantly seems to keep you from work. Another, it's things that repeatedly break for no reason. This is a brand new washing machine. Why is it broken? We just brought it new. right? Losing job after job, you're dismissed for no reason. And the question you ask yourself, is something spiritual or not? The question you ask is how many Bad things have to happen before you realize this is not normal. If it's one so I can get it, it's life. Those things happen, no big problem. But this is becoming a pattern. There's something deeper going on. 
Listen to what the Bible says in Judges chapter 6. The children of Israel were planting crops, but every single year the Midianites would come. They would raid them seven years in a row. And in Judges 6.6, 6, the Bible says the children of Israel were greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. You recognize that the enemy did not attack their health did not attack their lives. He attacked their ability to prosper and he impoverished them. This is so many people. You work hard to get ahead. You're so close to doing well, to having savings, to breaking through and last minute you feel robbed. You try again and you're robbed. Well, why? I don't know why the money. Why can I not hold on to it? The Bible says that Job was living well. He was a good man, actually the only or most righteous man in all of the land. But the Bible says one day a messenger comes to him with bad news and it's like an awful situation. There's a messenger at the door. Job, I just need to let you know some enemies came and robbed uh, your business and all of your animals have gone. It's terrible. Nothing's left. We're so, so. As he's talking about that, he's on the phone for that. Somebody else comes down the drive and they say, Job, we're so sorry, but we had another problem. This time it's your business. And then somebody else comes. Job, there's a problem with your children. There was an accident, the home fell in, and all of them died. None of them. I'm the only one that escaped. Job's life went from good to bad. To the, you, you can't describe how bad it was. None of us would have experienced that. But when you read the scripture, you thank God for the Bible. Amen. It gives you a full eagle-eyed perspective. What was going on? Why did that happen to Job? Because the devil was assaulting his life. It wasn't normal. It wasn't just circumstances. There was a supernatural dimension to his impoverishment. What that means is that sometimes spiritual forces also are able to block our blessing. Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, 15, If you do not obey the Lord your God carefully, follow all his commands and laws, I am giving you today the curses shall be upon you and stay and then verse 23 describes the description of a curse the sky above will be like bronze and the ground below will be like iron you see what that means is that it's so difficult you can't get ahead nothing will give for you God says that's not just circumstances there's something spiritual at work I ask you again, how many bad things have to happen before you recognize this is not just circumstances? So let me consider the entrance of the curse. Because I believe that there are three doors that can open or enter a curse for our lives. Number one is generational curses of sin or actually our descendants. See, when people sin, the Bible describes that it doesn't just affect the individual, but it affects families and other people after them as well. The, the spiritual imprint of sin can be passed down to families and children. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 5 verse 9, You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. How many people have seen this in life? It's a generational curse or a family of addiction. Man, my dad was a, a alcoholic. His dad was an alcoholic. There's nothing I can do because it's in my family. How many people know, right, depression, right? Oh, oh, man, I'm struggling with depression. It's in my family. Violence and aggression towards women. Why is that happening? Well, that's a pattern in the family. This is also true of money. 
I remember reading a book a couple of years ago called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, what the rich teach their children that the poor and middle class do not. It's a very good read, by the way, uh, and, and, and I'd recommend it to you, but it opened my eyes. I remember reading some of these things and um, thinking, why did no one tell me about this? Why did no one teach me about these things? I need to get, I need to get in on this. I need to learn about these principles because it actually it runs, it, it happens from family to family, generation to generation. You see, this is poverty that is beyond simply opportunity or behavior. It runs in the family. Generational poverty, it's like when you look at your family, you know what? All of my family, or if not most of my family, struggle financially. Why is that? What is that in us? It's possible that it's sin or disobedience in family history that has brought curse upon our family. The second issue or open door is disobedience or personal decisions in sin. Many of the financial curses in our lives, whilst it would be nice to blame somebody else for it, my great, great uncle for my bad financial decisions, Actually, the Bible says that many of them are because of our own decisions. And you're welcome to say amen to that one. Amen. This, this, your, your, your great uncle who is dead did not make you buy those shoes. We just say, let's throw that in there. We'll, we'll leave that to the budgeting sermon later. You see, what that means is that if it's our decisions, this can be about sin or disobedience before or after salvation. Right When it's before salvation, uh, you, you're now saved. You're now right with God. Your heaven is your home. However, there are things, decisions that you made that still, you, there's still a consequence to those things. Those things still, you know, salvation, praying a prayer doesn't nullify the consequences of bad decisions or all bad decisions from our past. There can still be an open door for poverty. Many times we get involved in sin, we repent, but the consequences are still there. But this is also sin and disobedience after salvation. We know the Old Testament story of, uh, uh, of Achan, and the Bible says he was part of the children of Israel. He was blessed with them and all of those principles. But the Bible says that whilst they went to Jericho, this was God's uh, land. It was the principle of the tithe, if you like. It was God. This is mine. It's the first land. Don't touch it. And the Bible says that Achan, he saw the gold and he said, man, I could do with some of those. And he took them. He hid them under his jacket. And the Bible says he ran back home and he stuffed it under his tent. I don't know how they slept that night. It would have been the most awful sleep ever. But the Bible says they shoved it under and he pretended that nothing happened. But it was found out because God saw, God knew that his disobedience and his decision and that led to judgment on the children of Israel, on his life and his family's life. Listen to Malachi 3 again. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation bring the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. Says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. There is a promise and a blessing and hope there, but it begins with a warning. It says that there is consequences to disobeying or robbing God. Tithing is a Christian principle and an act of obedience to God. God, you know what? You give me everything. You only ask for 10% back. That takes that makes sense to me. It's all yours. Right, there's no use in praying for financial breakthrough if you're not obeying God with what he's already said. God, we're praying. God, I'm binding the devil. God, bless this, bless that, but I'm still not going to give. You can pray as much as you want. God doesn't bless disobedience. You see, there's a testimony I read which is very encouraging. 
uh, from uh, someone who started tithing, and they said, since I wanted uh, since I've wanted to make sure we give 10%, we've, we've really focused on our finances on a weekly basis, incomes, bills, spendings, etc. I've created spreadsheets to enter uh, into our income and our bills and our tithing. And since then, we've given over a little over 3000 this is America, $3,000 to our church since last November. I think it was about four months or so since uh, the, when they wrote it. But they said, but do you know what? Because of the increased scrutiny over our finances, we've been in a much better place financially. We haven't struggled to make sure our bills get paid, something we had always previously struggled with. It feels like we have extra money every week. And I always was a big naysayer when I heard people say, uh, 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 talk about the benefits of tithing. I always thought I can't afford that. I can barely pay my bills. But now I can't imagine doing it. It is not the church needs the money. The church is asking, the Bible says what the Bible says. And God says it's a blessing upon him who gives it. You see, the final open door is not actually to do with us or our family, but it's a demonic assault. How many know tonight that the devil is a robber? The Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. What that means tonight, sorry, I moved some of those scriptures around. Uh, what that means tonight is the devil doesn't care about what's right and wrong. I never met a robber who robbed someone's house and said, oh, no, you know what? I probably shouldn't have done that. It was against the law. I better take everything back. Right? They don't care about the law. The Bible says in Job 1.8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him. He has an honest and innocent man honoring God and staying away from evil. The devils didn't care what, the, what Job was doing. The devil didn't honor him. Oh, look, you're a good man. You're a righteous man. You give, you love, you pray for people. You're a, you're a respected man in the community. The devil said, perfect. Well, he's my target. Friend, you need to remember the devil is a thief. And he will, if he can scheme, if he can strategize, if he can fraudulently rip God's people off, then he will do everything he can. So let me talk finally tonight about breaking the curse of poverty. You see, the good news for those who experience poverty, and I think actually for many people, no matter where you are at, we recognize, man, I, I wish I could get ahead. The Bible says we don't have to live under a curse. You see, poverty was taken care of when Jesus went to the cross. It's a powerful revelation in Galatians 3, 13 and 14. The Bible says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the, the promise of the Spirit. If you think about Jesus on the cross, they had all sorts of things that they uh, uh, hurt him with, that they caused him to have, and every one of them has a symbol. The Bible says that he took a crown of thorns on his head. We understand, amen, that we have talked before about mental health and those that have mind troubles. Jesus was bruised in his mind so that you can be healed tonight. You don't have to deal with mental depression and isolation and so and all those things, my friend. Jesus took it to the cross for you. But also, amen, remember how he was pierced in his head. It was through thorns. When you go back to the Garden of Eden, the direct curse of sin was that thorns would come up from the ground. And if you uh, know about farming or you know about land, right, if you have thorns, it makes it a lot harder to go and work the land. And therefore, it affects you financially if that's your business. The understanding, amen, is that Jesus took the thorns on the cross, which is a physical expression of sin. 
and an ability or a restriction on God's people prospering. What that means tonight is whether it's through your descendants, whether it's through disobedience and decisions, or whether it's through demonic assault, Jesus on the cross broke the curse for us. So how do we break that curse of poverty? Three things and I close and we're going to pray. Number one, you have to break the curse of poverty by repentance. We confess our own sin and we say, Lord, I'm turning away from that sin. Repentance is a change of action. Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done or what I haven't. And God, I'm turning and I'm changing my actions. What that means is that we change what we do. And if God tells us something, we obey. Malachi 3.10, again, bring the tithes to the storehouse that there may be food in my house if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You reckon, God, you know what? I haven't obeyed you. I'm repenting. I'm going to obey. Second thing is that you break the curse of poverty by prayer. You pray, amen, against the recognition, this pattern, or my family has lived in poverty for generations. It stops with me because Jesus took it to the cross. You break the power of those curses over your life. Prayer is not simply one of the things I spoke about last night. I'm going to talk about it a bit on Sunday. Prayer is not simply politely asking God or making a request. Sometimes prayer involves a fight. You know what the will of God is. You know what should happen in your life. And therefore, Christian, you use your authority to fight in prayer for that thing. You know, when we got robbed a few years ago, um, you know, I was uh, away. Uh, it, was, it was terrible, amen. But we, we got, Charlotte called me one morning, babe, this second, something, someone came in last night. They took the car. I woke up. There's no car, right? It was like this horrible kind of moment. But you know what we done? We took dominion in prayer. She continued. I think they had a fellowship that afternoon. Continue to have that fellowship. We're not going to live in fear. We're not going to let this stop us. As soon as I got home, guess what we done? We put flashlights on the front. We wired this thing up. We're, you know what? We made a decision. We're going to fight this. We're not just going to hide away. You robbed us. That's not going to happen again. And that's what you need as a Christian. Devil, I'm not accepting this anymore. You know what? I'm fed up with never being able to pay my bills. I'm fed up with not being able to bless people. I'm fed up with working this job that is not what I wanted to do. And God wants me to do something else. You have to begin to fight in prayer. It involves reje rejecting poverty in your own spirit. God, this is not your will. I don't want to keep living like this. And as I said, it involves fighting the powers of hell at work in your life. The Bible says in Gideon, there were six years of cursing. And on that seventh year, God came to Gideon and said, rise up, mighty man of valor. God said, Gideon said, what do you want me to do? He was trying, Gideon was impoverished. He was got so used to poverty, he was simply treading grapes in a wine, in a press. And like, he was just trying to survive. That's what poverty does. I'm just going to, this is how life is forever. I'm just going to survive. God said to him, Gideon, rise up, you mighty man of valor. I have called you. The enemy will not subdue you anymore. And he rose up and fought. I close with a, a testimony of Pastor Tom Payne, a uh, very interesting, uh, uh, amazing story, actually. Um, he was living many years ago as a, as a Christi young Christian in, in Farmington, New Mexico, and he was trying to sell a car. But one of the things that would happen is every time he was ready to put the car in the paper, they, back then they didn't have internet, you'd have to go, you'd have to sign it up and you know put it into the uh, shop then you put it in the pay you pay the money they put it in the paper it gets printed and then you know it's a, a much uh, slower way of doing things but so he was like okay we're ready and so he'd go and put ready to put it in the paper but something would break on the car 
So he wouldn't be able to put it in the paper, and so he'd have to fix the car and spend money. And, and th- he, he kind of realized that, you know what, it, after three, two, three, four times, this is still happening every time I go, uh, and, and, and it's still, and every time it breaks down. One day, he got sick of it and cried out to God in prayer. He said, and he tells the story, he said, it, it's always been like this. It's always been in my family, and I'm sick of it. And, and he describes how he made this long prayer of every kind of condition and, and thing that he could think of, binding this and breaking the curse of that and speaking against family curse, all sorts of things. He had this huge prayer that he prayed, but, but the point is he commanded that spirit to leave. So I'm not living like this anymore. And he said something fundamentally changed at that moment. Not only did he sell the car, but he testified that from that period, the, the, that, that spirit, that mindset, that life of poverty began to break from his life. Today he's blessed and God's helped him and, and he prospers. But that's true for every single believer here tonight. I believe that whilst we live in the West Midlands, people can come into church and say, are we still in the West Midlands? Well, how is it that these people prosper in this place? How is it that these people receive blessing and give blessing? How is it that God is helping them? Because that's the very principle. It is, we're not accepting this. And we're going to believe what the Bible says for our lives. Amen. We want to pray tonight. Why don't we have every head bowed, every eye closed. Before we Christians take some time to pray, we want to take some time for anyone who is not a Christian. You're here, but you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to take some time to pray for you tonight. It would be a privilege that you would, be, uh, you would receive Christ as your Savior. You would repent of your sin, because there is a spiritual uh, impoverishment caused by sin, and, and, and it doesn't matter how hard we try, we need the ultimate cure, which is Jesus. You're here tonight, you don't know Jesus, but you want to get right. Would you simply lift up your hand, you're backslidden or unsaved? Anybody here? Amen. Amen. Then changing the call and talking to Christians. You're here tonight, and you recognize, you sense, as I'm preaching, giving examples, talking about Scripture, you say, hold on, that sounds like my life. I want to encourage you to keep coming on Wednesday nights, because we're working through this series. This is not a one sermon, and I'm good. Like, we need the whole thing. But we need to deal with this mindset. We need to deal with this spirit, and we need to deal with it spiritually. We need to recognize it for what it is. God, if there is a curse over my life, an open door, you recognize it perhaps in family. Years and generations have passed. No one has ever prospered. Conflicts and fights and money is always, you don't talk about it, it's just not there, it's just, it's always somebody else's money, we just leave that alone, recognize it and say, you know what, I don't want to live like that, that's not God's will, perhaps tonight it's your own decisions, disobedience to God in the tithe, it's, it's things that you're not living right, you're not being honest with your accounts, and you say, you know what, God doesn't bless dishonesty, God doesn't bless disobedience, so tonight you say, Lord, I'm getting that right, perhaps you recognize simply a demonic assault, there are patterns, there are things, and you say, Lord, like Job, man, I, I don't think I've done anything wrong, God, I'm doing my best, but Lord, I need you to intervene. We want to take some time tonight to pray and seek God. We're going to pray together.
once we finish. So why don't we open, these altars are open. Why don't you come out tonight? If God has spoken to you, you take some time tonight and deal with God. Tom Payne made that decision. I'm not accepting this anymore. I'm not living like this for the rest of my life. And he began to pray and take dominion. Christian, let's fight in prayer. And let's recognize it for what it is. Hallelujah. Best of all, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, Jesus, we thank you, God, for His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to take some time tonight to pray. And uh, you can stand to your feet this evening. We want to pray together as God's people. We want to take dominion um, uh, over this. We want to break the curse of poverty from our lives. So I want you to lift up your hands if you want to do that. Amen. Say these words and afterwards we're going to pray and take dominion. You pray personally. You seek God and you bind whatever you feel led by the Spirit of God to do so. So let's pray and believe God uh, together. Uh, you know, l let me just say as well, one of the things that is important is a recognition that, 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 that many times if you have lived on uh, a life of uh, benefits, if you lived on um, sickness or you've lived on things that just, hey, hey, you know, I'm given this and we live in a generous country. And like, honestly, it's an amazing thing that you can be blessed and helped and supported and all those things. And there's a good reason why people need support. But... Sometimes what happens, Pastor Arti Aragon, he's going to be here uh, in two weeks' time. He lives in one of the poorest, if not the poorest area in all of America, the native Indians. It, it, they have for generations expected the American government to support them because that was what was given in the, in the he'll explain it better, in the native Indians and the, and the cowboys and the, when they all came together and the American state, they said, look, we're going to take the land, but we will support you forever. And he said that it has destroyed the Navajo people because every problem we need to call a Washington. It's their fault. They need to give us money. And that mindset needs to change. God, I'm not just going to expect people to give me stuff. 
I'm going to make it myself. I'm going to believe. I'm not telling you to go cancel everything. I'm not, right? You, you, it's a process. But the mindset changes first. Lord, I don't want to receive this forever. I want to work off this. I want to be independent. I want to be in a place where I can prosper. So if you're going to pray that, amen, that's what we're praying. God, I'm not just going to have other people help me live. I want to be blessed by you. Amen. Let's lift up our hands. Let's believe God together. Say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for taking the curse of poverty onto the cross. And Lord, today I recognize the patterns of a curse in my life, in my family, in my circumstances. And tonight I bind that curse. I rebuke and I break every tie, every bad decision, every financial, every financial curse, every family curse from my life in Jesus' name. Set me free in my mind, in my life, in my circumstances. No longer will I live with lack. No longer will I accept mere survival. You have called me to prosper. And I thank you for it. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise together. Lord, we thank you. We rebuke your God and we bind. Set your people free tonight, I pray. God, to be a people of blessing, a people of grace. We give you. Let's sing that song out. Amen. As we close tonight. Uh, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, and sing like never before, O oh my soul. give God praise together. We thank you, Jesus. God, we need you. We praise you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go out in victory tonight, and uh, we're going to pray together. Mark, could you close us in prayer as we go? God bless you. Amen. And let's begin to live. Amen. In the way God's called us to live. Amen. God bless you tonight. Amen.